afternoon and welcome to our British Water Thought Leadership Series, Talking on Water. My name's Mark Fletcher and I'm the current Chair of British Water. I have with me today Sarah McMath. She's the Chief Executive of Market Operator Services Limited, or Mosul for short, who's kindly agreed to an interview which we're recording to share across the water sector. So good afternoon, Sarah. Good afternoon, Mark. Thank you. In terms of the outline for our interview, I'm going to ask a few questions and Sarah can then share her thoughts. And we might have some follow up for clarification. We'll see how we get on. I hope you're all suitably relaxed so we can make a start. So first of all, Sarah, could you explain simply what does Mosul do? So if you're a business customer in England, and there are approximately 1.2 million of those, you can choose who provides your retailer services. It's the same water, it's the same sewerage services that come from the water company, but you can choose your retailer uh, and they provide your billing and your customer service and hopefully addi additional services such as water efficiency offerings. That 1.2 million customers use about 30, 30% of water in England. So whilst it's a relatively small number of customers, they use about a third of all water consumed in England. And our job as Mosul, as Market Operator Services Limited, is effectively to ensure that that market operates um, in an effective and an efficient way and also to ensure that that market can continue can continue to develop and grow but with a real focus on providing choice and value to business customers in England and Wales. That's fantastic so what's your vision for Mosul and maybe you could I think you've got a new strategy that you're launching so what's your vision what's it all about? Uh, you're right, we do have a new strategy, but we have kept our vision the same. So we set our vision um, just over three years ago now, which is to use our collective expertise and our independent insight to enable the best customer outcomes. So as a central market operator, we're funded by trading parties. And by trading parties, I mean all water companies, uh, all retailers, any NAVs um, and self-supply retailers. So they they are effectively our members. So we're a member funded organisation, not for profit. So it's really important that our vision focuses on how best we use the collective expertise of our central team and the insight that that gives us to act in that independent way. So that that's our, our vision. Um, and you're right, we have, well, we are about to start our strategy from the 1st of April 2024. This is our second three year strategy. Uh, we set the first one, interestingly, during um, the first lockdown, uh, we, we <laughs> delayed, we, we were due to do it when we first went into lockdown. And um, at first we thought, oh, no, we'll delay it, we'll be back in the office soon. And uh, we ended up doing our, our first strategy entirely online. Um, and I will say, having gone through that experience a second time, there are definitely advantages from being able to get people in the room. And probably the thing I'm most proud of with this second strategy has been the degree to which we have uh, taken on board the views of a really wide range of stakeholders, uh, but also all of my team. Um, we refer to, to the team in Mosul as Moselers. We have 82 Moselers and all of them have had an opportunity to contribute to this strategy. And what the, this strategy does is it's not, we didn't start again. So effectively the first part of this strategy was to look backwards and say, what have we achieved over the last um, four years really? Because we had a period after I'd started before the first strategy launch. And the four pillars that we have settled on um, are four new strategic priorities are market confidence. That is the most important one. A lot of our journey over the last three years has been to build confidence in us as a market operator. 
And that is a real privilege. It has been really hard fought, but I'm conscious you can lose it very quickly. So that mark, that credibility we have as a central independent market operator is absolutely fundamental for our ability to drive the market forward. So market confidence is, is core, and that's about providing our core services. We have lots of rules in the market. There's lots of code. Okay. I think I have yes. over 2,000 specific code obligations. And it's wow. really important that we are on top of those, delivering those efficiently and effectively 24-7, 365 days a year. So market confidence is our, our number one priority. The second one is market systems. That is about we manage and operate a, a number of systems, the most importantly being the central market operating system, which is um, effectively where all the settlement happens. So the system takes meter reads from retailers who read the meters of the customers and it calculates the amount of wholesaler charges so it, it it's a really important it's really important it works there's a lot of yeah. money uh, yes. behind that about a third of the revenue um that goes into water companies so that that central system is really important um but it's really important that it doesn't just work today but it that it's fit for the future uh, the current system is an end-to-end -end SAP based system that was bluntly developed at Haste. The market opened on the 1st of April 2017 and it was it was a real rush to market opening. I was involved in it when I was still in Thames Water and there was a drop dead date. It was DEFRA led, no if, no buts, no maybe. This market will open yes. on the 1st of April 2017. Yes. That meant we developed a system that was suboptimal. We, you would not have developed it in the way we did. To give you an example, there are 5,000 processes all layered on top of each other. Logically, had you taken more time, as a new requirement came up, you would have adapted a previous process. We yeah. just did a bit of a hitch and put one on top. So Keep there's lots... Yeah. There's lots of issues with our, our system. Uh, we started to address that in our current strategy. We have rehosted CMOS into an Azure cloud environment, which makes it easier to um, change and maintain. But we need to um, effectively the next part is to cut that up into bits that I can't remember. There's a posh term for it that my team use, but effectively cut <laughs> it up into smaller bits so yeah. that we can make changes with less impact on water companies because every trading party interacts with our system so there's a big piece on systems and part of that is also about cyber security um so I, I explained at the beginning what we do um hopefully it was clear that we do not operate water assets however mm -hmm. there are clearly people quite a few in russia who think we do we have seen a very significant increase in cyber attacks okay. so a large part of our systems um Prior, system, market systems priority is to ensure that we can maintain the safety and security of our central systems. Um, and there's a big focus on uh, data in there as well as we move towards smart metering. I think we'll probably touch on that later. Yeah. The system is currently set up for the vast majority of customers have two meter reads a year and a smaller number of very large customers have 12 meter reads a year, monthly read, meter reads. The system is designed to cope with the data associated with that meter read frequency. As we okay. move into a world of smart metering, the data requirements increase disproportionately, but we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. Our third strategic priority is water security. Yeah. So I mentioned that um, business customers use about a third of all water in, um, in England. And a significant proportion of that is potable water being used for non-potable purposes, for example, for cooling, irrigation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. et cetera. And so we're focused on water security in terms of how can that third of the water used be part of the solution to ensure that we have water now and into the future. Again, we'll, we'll maybe touch on that again later. There's also okay. something very specific in that strategic priority around what happens when we run out or, or nearly run out of water in the short term. So two years ago, we were days away as a, as a, a water industry from non-essential use bans. 
Yeah. So a non-essential use ban effectively tells a, a proportion of businesses that they can no longer use water, window cleaners, car washes. Yeah, yeah. We have not had a non-essential use ban since the market opened and we did not have a process in place to, to enact that yeah. should that happen. So there's a specific piece of work in there on, on the drought processes, what actually happens. Um, and then the final one is on market evolution, and that's about what next. So we see our role as both performing within the sector today, but also working with the market to transform the market to better meet the needs of uh, customers into the future. And that that is one of our guiding principles of a continuum of our role to continue to perform, to have that confidence and credibility to transform. And then our second guiding principle in our strategy has been to really challenge ourselves where we are the best or the only place to carry out a, a specific principle or strategic goal. So mm -hmm best would be um only would be for example the market settlement we are the only people who can run that operation yeah. and then we challenge ourselves on anything new and shiny to make sure that we are the best and the most efficient um group to 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 carry out any specific activity so that that yes. that i guess no, that, sorry. That, that's fascinating i'm really pleased to hear you talk about systems thinking about how you really taking a, a fresh look at the shortcomings of the system that was put in place in the first place and how you yeah. can improve that. I think that's really important. And those are the sorts of things I think will build confidence and trust. So um, and uh, and efficiency, which I think yeah. is really important. So are there any challenges that uh, need to be addressed in this sort of non household market? Um, what do you think they are? <laughs> there are a lot. I, I'm going to try and focus on just five. I mean, at the heart of it, I think it's it's important to note that um, if you go back to what we were seeking to achieve in the non-household market, um, back when the Water Industry Act was drafted from 2014 onwards, we were expecting to see a one a higher level of switching than we currently have. We have relatively low rates of switching, particularly for small customers. We were expecting to see um, retailers developing specialist services. So, for example, yeah, we're going to be the experts in irrigation, and we're going to develop uh, rainwater harvesting, rainwater recycling, and we're going to, you know, absolutely nail this part of the market. And we were expecting much more activity around water efficiency within um, premises. Yeah. So, so with that sort of expectations in mind, um, the, the areas where that sort of crystallises in terms of challenges today is probably most importantly, let, let's start with water security, because it's probably one of the biggest, well, I think it's unarguably one of the single biggest challenges we fa face as a water sector at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, and what is clear today is that the incentives are not in the right place to ensure that business customers are part of the solution. So I'll give you an example. As it currently stands today, the um, larger users in the market, many of whom are using potable water, some of the best quality drinking water in the whole world for non-potable purposes. So they are using it to for irrigation or even worse, for spraying the outside of metal tanks to cool them down. So this is a lot of water and it gets cheaper the more they use. And that yeah. sort of makes your brain hurt. If you're outside the water industry and you don't understand bulk tariffs, it's sort of illogical i, I yes. get the economics so the economic state that there is a fixed and variable cost of water production that you have a sort of fixed cost of the assets that as your base and then the, basically the higher the volume you smear that and water becomes cheaper but it doesn't reflect the environmental impact so it no. means for very large users there is simply no financial incentive to use less water it's such a tiny part mm -hmm. of their overall 
utilities bill that there is literally zero incentive to use less of it. So, so that link between water security, knowing what those challenges are, but bluntly, there is no financial incentive for people to use less water. So, I mean, there's, a, there's an issue there, isn't there, really? First of all, what's the quality of water that you're using? Yeah. Which is, and then how do we encourage this concept of sort of megalitres? How do we start saving exactly. water? And it might yeah. be by the reverse of what you've said, by increasing tariffs. Exactly. Uh, that, so that water, might encourage yeah. you to value water more. Yeah. If you're using large volumes. Yeah. So that, yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think that that specific point around um, one of the areas that we are keen to focus in on is the real value of water and me, really importantly the cost of not having water so i'll give you an example there's a large food producer in england who if you look at their energy bills they spend about 45 uh, million pounds a year on electricity about 40 million pounds on gas 10 million pounds on oil storage their water bill is 1.2 million there is literally no financial incentive for them to use less of it however if they don't have water yeah. they cannot run their factories and produce food it's business so, critical yeah absolutely so we're starting to really drive the concept of the cost of not having water so what would the economic impact be of uh, let, let's look at something though food production is an obvious one but look at yes. something like the the city of london um the financial sector if they didn't have water for um 12 hours or even less than that it's not about not being able to have drinking water because you can provide that in bottles if you can't flush the toilets then you have to send your workers home if you can't flush the toilets in a hotel you have to send your guests home so yes. the cost of not having water is something that we're keen to, to to see if there's a value equation there because there really right. isn't in the actual f financial cost of saving water and then right. i guess the challenge at the heart of, of the non-household sector is actually the, the the competing government drivers so yes. on one hand you've got a very strong growth agenda which includes an increase in food security that means food production, which we've already mentioned, and farming, both hugely water intense, an increase in innovation, data centres, one of the fastest growing areas of water yep. usage, incredibly water intense. Net zero decarbonisation drives you towards <laughs> hydrogen. I know that's something British Water are very well aware of, that that yeah, has yeah. a massive impact on water um, or has a massive demand for water. Um, the levelling up agenda is is focusing growth into areas like East Anglia where there simply isn't any water. It's not that they're going to run out mm -hmm. in 10 years time. Anglian water are already turning away um, growth in the region because they simply have got no water. Mm -hmm. At the same time of all of those upward drivers to use more water, you've got a DEFRA top down target saying that by 2039, Water companies need to demonstrate that they've reduced non-household consumption by 9%. It, it simply doesn't add up. It, it, and there is a lack of coordination of some of these drivers to ensure that the incentives are in the right place. Oh, well, we'll see. Well, we'll have a chat with someone at DEFRA. We'll see what they've got to yeah, say. Yeah, see, so we'll, see what they I'll have to say. We we're working very spot. closely with DEFRA, actually. Yeah, and yeah. I would say that they're... Um, their, I was about to say their new deputy director, Martin's been there um, a while now, but Martin Woolhead is yes. is really engaged with the non-household market and has been um, a breath of fresh air in terms of really seeking with his team to understand the challenges and being very open to exploring the best way to meet those. So, which I guess leads me on to data. Um, so you asked, you know, challenges. Data is at the heart of everything we do. So whilst I talked about our four strategic priorities and underpin to those are um, is people and data. Fundamentally, my main asset in Mosul is, is 82 amazing brains who, uh, who, who know everything there is to know about the water market and the data that we bring in from those 1.2 million customers. 
I mentioned earlier the market was opened at haste. There was not a robust data assurance exercise carried out pre-market opening. Um, I was in a water company at the time and the requirement for market entry was not whether you ha your data was correct. It was, is it in the right format and is it complete? So as long as it was a complete data set and say it had to be to two decimal points, it was all to two decimal points, you right. pass the data assurance. The data didn't have to be correct. And, and I know that sounds mad when we say no, it now, yeah, yeah, but there was a all about proper validation. It was yeah. all about quantification. It was all about quant. It was all about completeness. So we are working with trading parties and and a third party um, sagacity to deliver a data assurance service. And some of this is really basic. It's is it is should this um, customer be in the market? So is it does it meet the eligibility criteria? And we're finding a number of household customers who are in the market, but also some lack of clarity around things like um, farms. Uh, farms are in the market if they're commercial farms. They're not in the market if it's a farm where you're producing food for your own usage. Um, Airbnbs, holiday lets, there's all sorts of grey areas, um, but also address data. The, the address data is really poor in the market. Um, so it's really, really basic. And then yeah. that leads on to um, the next challenge, which is around our ability to segment the market. So I mentioned one of the drivers pre-market opening was to see specialisation of trading parties, of retailers. Let, let, let's take a scenario where um, the CEO of a retailer has a really great idea. They've got a couple of golf courses in their region. They're working with a really innovative supplier, um, somebody in the supply chain around rainwater harvesting, greywater reuse. And they think, I, I think we should specialise in golf courses. This looks, this looks like a real opportunity to provide a, a value added, environmentally focused service. Yep. They go to their board. The first question that you as board chair would ask is, that's interesting. How, how many golf clubs are there in England? And he'd say, don't know. I know how many we've got in our portfolio. Um, OK, so how much water is consumed by the golf course market? And he'd have to say, or she would have to say, don't know. Um, we just simply don't have that data. Mm -hmm. So we see that robust data with clear industry segmentation okay. as an underpin to innovation and to allow retailers to effectively um, get that level of specialisation, to work with others, to, to really help customers in a very, very targeted way. So is that underlying research that Mosul are doing or that they're seeking from the companies? So we're you know, doing that. A handle on, right? Okay. Yeah, so we, yeah. We, we're working um, actually in a number of areas. We're working with DEFRA on a specific project in Cambridge, which you may already be aware of. There's a, a water project in Cambridge, which we are supporting with the data on. Um, it would be great if we could get, um, if we could learn from the Cambridge project, what good looks like in terms of how to get to proper granular market segmentation. Yes. Um, so to provide that clear review of who's using the water, where they're using it, when they're using it, starts to lead to innovation. We mentioned tariffs earlier. If yeah. you're a food production plant, actually you do need potable water. But if you're a 24 seven operation, actually you may be able to take that water and store it on an on-site service reservoir yeah. when nobody else is using it so outside of peak draw you could say you know between midnight and 4 a.m yeah. if i'm a, a large food producer i will i will take my water then i will therefore reduce demand when household customers want it but in order to do that you have to understand where the water is being used and most importantly the incentives need to be in the right place. I, so the I biggest agree. challenge we have today is the money's on the wrong table. So yes. there is a strong incentive for water companies to invest in as in their assets to grow their yes. RCV because bluntly that's yeah, how they yeah, make uh, money. Yeah, that's the way yes. the industry is structured. Going for customer side site based solutions at the moment is not cost effective, and we need to explore how you'd shift that dynamic to yes. 
enable businesses to be part of the longer term solution and to stimulate it yes i i, yeah. I, I see yeah but, and, and part of that is open data as well that's probably i'd say is the final one i was challenge i was going to call out i'll, I'll stop at that i could go on all day which i'm, I promise I'm, I'm a huge advocate for open data so i'm really yeah. pleased to hear you say that and i also think again going back to what you said at the start we build t- trust and confidence with things like data validation but, but, and Absolutely. by demonstrating that that's what you're doing as part of your ongoing raising the bar i think that's a that's a real positive yeah and so, on, on on open data just very briefly i think our challenge there is to work out with working with key stakeholders and trading parties is what does that actually mean in the non-household market and 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 what would be the value of some form of of central data platform me especially as we move into smart metering so i said earlier bluntly cmos our settlement system will not be the right solution for smart metering data in the longer term we need to look at a smarter solution and and separate out settlement bluntly for settlement all you need is two data points you need the start of a billing period the end of a billing period that could be a month or it could be a year that's different from the value you get out of more granular consumption data and potentially making that data more open but but that is definitely in the early stages working with off what and others to see what what good could look like i get that i I, I mean some of the data i think maybe we got preoccupied as an industry with real-time data and we're getting a bit more into real enough time and different time steps things, things absolutely and so one final point on that which is a really important statistic for the non-household market i mentioned at the beginning 1.2 million customers Five hundred thousand of those so half a million of those customers use less than 100 litres of water per day. So that's less than any domestic premise. And that could be a scout heart, a church hall. Um, And at the other end, you have 1% of customers, just 13,000 customers who use half of the water. So they use 15, 1.5% of all water in England is going into just 13,000 premises. So we have a massively skewed market yes. and back to your point that therefore is there any value in a scout heart having 15 minute data when the toilets are flush for a couple of it's hours on a thursday afternoon uh, you need to know if there's continuous flow because you want to pick yes. up leakage but there are other ways of doing that so uh, it's, i agree yeah. and there's an element of pragmatism that you want to bring into that process yeah. and common sense that's good so maybe a slightly different tack what's your view of the su- supply chain's role in helping to solve some of these future challenges and um, I, I think you touched yeah. on your innovation fund but maybe yes. is, is there something in there where the supply chain could help um absolutely so um we do have a market um improvement fund it's actually the strategic panel we support the strategic panel in, in mosul and we administer the fund on behalf of the strategic panel um we've done three rounds in our market improvement fund since we we put it in just over three years ago and we've recently awarded eight hundred and seventy thousand pounds of funding to eight successful projects uh, mm. this this is the first time we were significantly oversubscribed so we had 15 um applications in total and that's the highest since the fund was launched um and that market improvement fund provides a platform for innovators to conduct pilots research test potential solutions to where there are problems in the market and it has a real focus on those projects which aim to make the market better for customers or and or the environment and you know, they can be the same thing but a real yeah. focus on the right environmental outcome if you look at the ones that we've awarded um, recently, there is a, um, a a lot of focus on water efficiency. Yep. But really importantly, um, what that starts to identify is the point I made earlier about the money being on the wrong table. So I'll give you one example of a successful, I think it was round one, might have been round two, a, a successful okay. MIF project where Pennant Water Services worked with Plymouth Argyle football um yeah. club there was a disused sewer attenuation tank so basically just a large tank in the sewer system that wasn't being used yeah. 
they did they worked with a a, a partner to um retrofit rainwater harvesting equipment that meant that the sewer attenuation tank could fill up with water during periods of rainfall and then could be used to irrigate the pitch at Plymouth Argyle. All yeah. of that sounds eminently sensible. It's a good environmental solution. It's reducing the demand in an area which is water stressed. There was no way of that being financially viable without the Market Improvement Fund. Right. So whilst that was a good project, yeah. probably the, the bigger question is how can we ensure that projects like that are the norm that 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 yes. is financially viable that a, a supply chain partner can come in and work with a customer and provide a viable solution to water security and at the moment the fund provides the funding but then you realize well that's great but without that funding it wouldn't happen so i think so, the market improvement yes. fund is is key so there's still still some and it's understanding those and breaking those down and analyzing them to yeah. understand where the shortfall comes so that we get a win 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> ultimately with plymouth argyle moving up the league yeah. <laughs> on, on their beautifully uh on their beautiful green pitch irrigated yeah, by rainwater yeah. yeah so exactly. so i think yeah we strongly encourage third parties and um yeah. companies in the supply chain to submit or be part of bids i should say they can't um they can't go it alone in the bid there is a yes. an application has to be sponsored by at least one trading party um or by us in mosul and so we have supported uh, bids which is is one of the reasons you know it, it's important yeah. we we govern it but we don't um, we have no say in the selection of um bids no, that no. is done by an independent selection panel but um yeah really encourage the supply that, chain again ensuring there's no conflict it is really yeah. important to get confidence and trust and i it think is. that's something that off what i've learned through their uh process which is which so it's really good and it's really good to get a bit more visibility of this hmm. because generally there's a lot of discussion about off, off what yeah. we're doing the touching on what defra are doing it's really good to hear this so that i think yeah that's really and we'd good. always be very happy to to share that with your members in more detail when the next round comes that, up um, that, would, that would be really if we can give it any greater visibility yeah. just let us know what we can do yeah we will do that um, um the the other area i'd say from a supply chain perspective is in um smart metering so as your um with as hopefully your members are aware there is a high, much higher penetration of metering today in non-household than there is in household about 80 yeah. percent of um customers are are billed on on metered data um and all of them at, at the higher level a much higher proportion um however the majority of those are dumb meters uh, we are very shortly going to be publishing a national metering strategy which whilst it's focused on non-household yeah. if you look at the 1.4 million meters in the market 1.12 million of those are exactly the same specification as a household meter so whilst our work is focused on non-household yeah. it has a lot of spillover benefits into into household um, I should also say that um, when you're looking at water efficiency programmes for non-household, um, about 90% of the customers, so not the water consumed, but the customers making decisions about water are using that water for domestic purposes. So a lot of the messaging work, we, we feel very strongly that there shouldn't be sort of a household campaign and a non-household campaign. No, there no, should no. be campaigns focused on what is the water being used for. Um, so back to smart metering, um, we see some really ambitious plans from companies. So um, we've seen a push from DEFRA, a push from Offwalt, and um, that all will all have to be delivered, as you know. Um, you, you, we won't know how much and and by when until we get the final determinations. But we do have a concern that there could well be a supply chain constraint if the supply chain isn't fully engaged with um, what some of those requirements will be. And, and I would separate that into two things, the first of which we're less involved with, which is you know, basically, have we got enough metres? in England to meet that yeah, yeah. demand. Do yeah. we have enough people out 
with the ability to install meters. So there, there is a very, yeah, nice. very real construction asset based issue. Yeah. Probably a bigger issue is is around the data. So actually, how will this data be stored? Um, do water companies have the right data platforms in place? Yes. Is yeah. it logical for them to put in 15 different data platforms? Is it logical to do something separate for household and non-household? My view, the answer for those last two questions is no, it's not logical. So I think there's a there's there is a lot of thinking um, to be done in how the supply chain responds to the data that is generated from these assets. I agree, but a lot of what you just shared here, I think, for some people, it will it will start to really clarify the picture and why it makes mm. sense to do things in a more joined up way and a less siloed way. And yes. may, maybe sometimes it comes across a little bit siloed in the way in which things are talked about. So yeah. again, moving a little bit, and I think you touched on it, but I think what what about opportunities to collaborate to safeguard our environment and maybe help deliver social contract for communities we work with? I'd, I'd say there are two key things in there, one of which I've already mentioned. So I think the first one for me is, is being really honest about the lack of incentives at the moment for the water sector i'm not going to say just water companies because i, I think yes. it's the regulator it's government it's the whole water sector but at the moment i would go as far to, as to say that the current regulatory construct and the way in which the market is designed of less the market actually more the regulatory construct as a whole actively drives deterioration of the environment it, it, yes. it, it actively discourages nature-based solutions. I know a number of water companies are working really hard, some of them with your members, on nature-based solutions. It's really, really hard to get them through. Um, okay, and, and it shouldn't be that difficult. And you know, the Plymouth Argyle one is the one I always come back to. That, that just should be the most logical thing in the world to improve the local environment, to, um, it, to be able to take water potable water being used for non-potable purposes off grid and release that potable water back into the the, the demand for the system yes. so for me that that opportunity to collaborate is let let's just it, it's not about blaming anyone it's about coming I together know. and saying it doesn't work today it, it we are it, the, yes. the whole system drives us to do the wrong thing for the environment and that can't be right nobody wants that to happen and um, i think the way in so, which the wrmp informs the price control that whole process yes. drives the wrong outcome for customers and the environment in some cases so uh, um, and I, I agree with you completely uh, we've been t talking about this idea of a much greater, much greater common purpose when we look at regulatory yeah. reform that aligns with clear outcomes that everybody's seeking. Otherwise, we, we can have well-intended principles that are resulting in uh, unintended consequences and outcomes. And it yeah. feels a little bit like somewhere we aren't quite getting that alignment and yeah. it wouldn't take a lot to nudge and adjust and and maybe there's opportunity in this amp and the next stamp because of the investment yeah. that's coming through that we're going to have to knock some of the corners off and get the things working better yeah couldn't agree more mark and i think it is that absolute focus on what it, what are we delivering for customers and the environment and and a point um you made earlier you know I think the collaboration point is really, really important that we don't assume that the non-household market will solve the problems of non-household consumption. That's naive. Mm. It, it won't. The market right. will not resolve it on its own. A water molecule doesn't know whether it's going into a Coca-Cola factory, a household or onto a field. That The system is a single system and water companies are still 100% accountable for 100% delivery of clean, safe drinking water and removal of sewage. The fact that 30% of it has a retailer involved in the transaction is irrelevant when it comes to long term water resource management planning. I agree. I agree, and I think that's and that, I think that's a real strong message that's been coming through a, across a number of your answers to to the some of the questions. 
Um, and I guess the second point, sorry, just the second point on that, on, a la, uh, opportunities to collaborate. I think the second one, I was at the um, uh, the social contract summit last week oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the independent, that was run yes. by Independent and the Water Report, which was a really excellent session to bring people together. And, um, and in fact, Lilla was speaking there. Was, and, yeah. and I think what Lilla was saying really resonated with everyone in the room, which is, you know, we sort of... When it comes down to it, we can let's all agree that there are challenges in the water sector, both in terms of historic investment in assets, particularly underground assets, and that there isn't a clear and joined up approach to delivery moving forward. If we all accept that to be true, we need to stop wasting our energy and focusing on, well, you know, is it the regulators fault? Is it the government's fault? Is it the water companies? Is it the shareholders? Is it the investor community? It's sort of all of them. But we must get past that. That's just a waste of our emotional energy to focus on, on who's most to blame. So if you take that concept of collaboration, again, what we saw, um, there were a couple of examples, a um, guy from Manchester talking about their integrated water resources management planning. Yes. That for me is the real opportunity around um, collaboration. And we spoke to... Um, someone from the GLA, for example, at that, around the work they're doing. Again, they yes. hadn't really considered business customers and the non-household market. We have a huge amount of data insight within my team. Um, yes. We create a lot of dashboards that generate the data, that generate data insight in different areas. So we are, we are very keen to share that data insight yes. with anybody yes. who um, has the ability to help deliver for safeguarding yes. the environment or to deliver the social contract for communities and recognising that businesses are part of those local communities and they have a bigger part to play than potentially they do today. I agree. And I think that lack of alignment and the, you know, always seeing the challenge rather than seeing the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think that's the thing that we've got to reverse. It hasn't, it hasn't been held by some of the press around the sector but i i think that um there's a realization uh, and maybe with the amps that are coming and the fact that we, we we've got some um residual problems that are now coming home to roost that we've, we've actually got to work differently together and in the various discussions that i've been holding with the chief executives of of uh, off what and uh, or chairs of off what and the environment agency and dwi and yeah. ccw there's, there's definitely a sense that we've got to work together better going forward. So Absolutely. I'm really I'm really encouraged to hear that. Um, and we've got a general election coming up. Do you think yeah. that's a positive opportunity for Mosul going forward? Is is there something that could be grasped? Um, I would hope so. I think um, I'm an optimist, but I'm going to start with the, the the risk and maybe the challenge. I think the risk is that um there is a lot of noise and focus on a, on general election and we lose a focus on water i think this government whether i think it's in the right focus in the right area i won't give an opinion yeah, on that yeah, yeah. there is a focus on water there is a recognition of water security challenges and the challenges around for example you know pollutions and and river water quality I think there is a risk that political noise um, jumps on the wrong thing. Yes. So I was struck, uh, I was at the British Water Session a few weeks ago that Alan Lovell spoke at, and yes. I think there is a real danger that media amplification and political will drives the direct debate in the wrong direction. Oh. Um, having said that, I think there is a massive opportunity with any changing government to be able to present opportunities and whilst yes. there's a lot of talk about the non-household market isn't delivering in terms of switching and value I would turn that around to say there is a massive opportunity in non-household that simply hasn't been realised there isn't a single site-based solution in any of the um, second revised draft WRMPs so this is 30% yes. of the water there is an opportunity for a new government to have a positive story about water rather than it all being about shareholders 
dividends, the state of the, the the asset base. So I think there's a, there's an opportunity, and we're yeah we're very keen to get that message out there. This is. I, I don't want to say, I, I keep saying an untapped opportunity, but that sounds really cheesy. I need to think no, it's of a better a way of putting it. <laughs> it's a great pun. <laughs> you're you're uh, overflowing with ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, maybe just to finish, anything else you'd like to share with our members, uh, Sarah? Really just... You, you, no, we're here. We we feel like sometimes we're we're one of the best kept secrets in the water industry yeah, outside yeah. of um the fit the 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 direct sphere of sort of off what uh, Susie Water Defra who we work with very closely. Um, we are always happy to to share the independent insight that we have and very keen to engage with the supply chain as I said particularly around some of the challenges around water security and smart metering. So. Get in touch. So, well, part of our role is to turn those challenges into opportunity and to try and get much more focus for the supply chain. So many thanks, Sarah. That was fantastic. You're Very welcome. open, really full of facts and information. And I think people will get a lot of insight from what you've shared. I really welcome your willingness, not just to just to share your thinking very openly and uh, but also some of your ideas and concerns. I think there's opportunity there and we'll see what comes. We want to wish you every success in your role uh, and on behalf of British Water and like to express our thanks. Um, anything we, that we can do in terms of help or support going forward or uh, amplifying messages around innovation rounds or whatever it might be, we'd be really interested to do. But um, thank you very much. That concludes our session. Effectively, that's a wrap. Uh, and, it, and, um, and thank you very much for your time. No problem. Thank you.